Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is L.B. Eisen, and I direct the Justice Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. First, we'll leave time for questions at the end of this terrific discussion. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please feel free to ask to add them via the question and answer box. Second, we provide live closed captioning. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to repair, revitalize, and when necessary, defend our systems of democracy and justice. We are grateful to our producing partners for this event, NYU's John Bradamus Center, which advocates for civil debate in politics and public policy. This afternoon's conversation is taking place one year after the police killing of George Floyd. That murder ignited a mass movement centered on persistent police violence against Black Americans and intensified calls for systemic change. If we are to make clear as a society that Black lives matter, there must be a new relationship between the police and the communities that they are charged with serving and protecting. But reform must go far deeper than policing to address the broad reach and overreach of the criminal legal system, its harshly punitive approach, and the need to invest in our communities. This afternoon, we have two champions of justice who have spent their lives fighting for a more fair, and just criminal legal system. We are proud to call DA Krasner and Professor Davis partners in our work to transform prosecutorial practices nationwide. In our recent report, 21 Principles for the 21st Century Prosecutor, we collaborated with Fair and Just Prosecution and the Justice Collaboratory to propose principles that prosecutors should follow in order to reduce incarceration and improve transparency and fairness. In our publication, we highlighted many of the practices in DA Krasner's office. To that end, I am thrilled to welcome Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner and distinguished professor of law at American University, Washington College of Law, Angela Davis. Angela, over to you. Thanks so much. LB, it's really great to be here, and thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. Larry Krasner spent 30 years as a civil rights and criminal defense attorney in Philadelphia, working to get justice for his clients before deciding that the way to truly transform this broken criminal legal system is to get inside of it. So he launched an unlikely campaign to become the district attorney of Philadelphia a city with one of the highest incarceration rates in the country due to a long line of tough on crime DAs. And despite long odds and very strong opposition from the police union and other forces of the status quo, Krasner laid out a simple case for radical reform and won the November general election by a margin of nearly 50 percentage points. And just last week, he won the Democratic primary, which essentially means that he will be reelected and will serve a second term. So congratulations, Larry. Um, I, I want to start before we jump in just by saying I loved the book. Um, it teaches the reader about criminal justice policy in a way that's interesting and easy to understand. Uh, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand it. And you teach it, I mean, it's hard to teach criminal justice policy, you know, and, and have it be a, a page turner, but it really is. And it's because of all of the compelling stories that you tell that I think really so powerfully illustrate everything that's wrong with our criminal legal system. Um, and I also loved it because I learned a lot about you that I didn't know. Um, I really enjoyed uh, learning about your background and about the experiences that you had throughout your life. And um, learning about those experiences really taught me, you know, why it is that you're so committed uh, to this work and so passionate about it. Uh, but before we dive into the book, I really like LB, I want to acknowledge 
that it has been a year since the murder of George Floyd and the culmination of an extraordinary year uh, of protests and demands for change. And of course, you know, you spent your entire career, Larry, uh, holding cops accountable for misconduct uh, as a civil rights lawyer and now as district attorney. And you also represented protesters from all kinds of social movements. So I thought it might be good if we stopped, you know, if we started with you just briefly reflecting on this year and specifically like what motivated you to do that work. <clears throat> well, thank you for that, Angela. That was the kindest thing I've ever heard about that book. I appreciate it. Um, so it really has been a year. There's no question about it. For me, in many ways, the most memorable moment of this year uh, was seeing a police chief testify against his own because that runs completely counter to uh, you know, what has essentially been a caste system in some ways of the blue at the top of the caste. And then there's everybody else. Um, obviously there's much more to it, many more dimensions to it. And the, you know, the image of what happened to George Floyd is just tough. But for me, that was, that was a moment. That was a, uh, how shall we put it? That was a, a lighthouse maybe for all of those police chiefs and police commissioners out there and those mayors out there who are trying to figure out what the path ahead is. The path ahead looks like that. It looks like doing the job they always should have done, but never really did in terms of holding their own accountable. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, so I want to start with a question that I know you get all of the time. Uh, and the book ultimately, you know, and entirely answers this question. But what's your short answer to why would someone who spent decades really successfully, you know, representing people uh, who've had their rights violated by police officers and others and freeing people from the criminal legal system as a successful criminal defense attorney. Um, you did that so well for decades and then you decided to join the other side. I mean, what, why did you decide to do that? Well, um, I might dispute that I joined the other side because the people on the other, other team were going the wrong direction. But I, but I would say that I wanted sweeping change. You know, I had, I had been a very, very active trial lawyer in, in, criminal defense, but also in civil rights for 30 years. And I had gotten a lot of justice for individuals. But here, come, here, I, here I come, I look at the calendar, I'm 56 years of age, and I'm feeling kind of sort of like uh, the system got worse the whole time. Certainly, that's what I witnessed when I was in court. And the jails got fuller and, and public school buildings were literally for sale with for sale signs on them in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and I just felt like, all right, well, you haven't really you haven't really done that much, have you? You made a choice to feel good about what you did. You made a choice to help people. That's a good thing. But that choice meant you did not choose the levers of power. And there, you know, we were already in a moment when there were progressive prosecutors being elected. We were in a moment after Michelle Alexander wrote what she wrote and then other people wrote what they wrote. We were in a moment after Ferguson and after, uh, you know, James Foreman wrote, um, locking up our own and uh, in a moment after Kendrick Lamar is winning the Pulitzer, same year as Foreman, I think, we were in a moment. And it was clear to me that what was not possible 30 years ago might be possible now. So why not choose to take the leaders of power? Why not choose to have someone in that office who would actually listen to what I would have said and what I would have thought as a defense attorney? And you won, <laughs> which was just pretty extraordinary. I mean, in many ways, I see this book as, you know, it's about a lot of things, but it's also a book about democracy, right? I mean, about, you know, what democracy can be, you know, um, we, we, our democracy seems so broken now, but, you know, you made it work. And, you know, that's what's so extraordinary. Like how in the world did someone with your back background you spend your whole time fighting the system with no political connections, you know, not part of the political machine. In fact, just the opposite of that. But yet you won. And so how did you do that? Well, you know, in the same way somebody like Kim Fox or Aramis Ayala was redefining what it meant to be a prosecutor, we, we need to redefine what it means to be a politician. It turned out that all of those activists I had represented mostly for free all those years who kept getting arrested 
for protest are really better at politics than most of our centrist politicians. This is why nobody votes. It's why nobody wants to vote. So not only did we see um, this remarkable potential in Philly because we felt like politicians were so disconnected from what people wanted, we knew that activists and a certain part of the centrist Democratic Party that was still intact, that was still vital, that was still doing the work, we knew that they had the ability to, to hold hands. And that's exactly what they did the first time. But let me say this, Angela, this time, oh my goodness, did we improve on it. This time, as of yesterday, we actually had more than two out of every three votes in Philadelphia during a primary. And we didn't just have more votes, but we had actually increased yet again the level of participation very significantly. We're at a point now where the number of voters who came out to vote in an election where the DA is the top of the ticket here uh, is so much more than it was two cycles ago that we're not just seeing that people will vote for us, we're seeing that there is enthusiasm to vote. And that is absolutely crucial in a country where we have one party desperately trying to take away the vote from uh, poor people and black people and brown people and Democrats. They are trying to take it away as quickly as they can. And the, really the only remedy is a massive and immediate blue wave of votes turning out. So in many ways, I see the struggle to, to, to save democracy and the struggle, struggle to change criminal justice as being the same struggle because it is the efforts at criminal justice reform that will turn out a very large number of people who other, otherwise flat out won't vote. That, I mean, that's, that's so interesting. I mean, first of all, as you know, like people in the past anyway, didn't pay attention to district attorney races at all, right? No one, even people, I mean, usually, you know, you'd have one name on there, they're running on a post. People don't know who the district attorney is. So things have really changed and you've helped that a lot. You know, it's interesting you talk about the coalition of people who came together. And that's one of the most interesting things that I, that I found about the book is how, how these very different people, right? From, you know, from ACT UP to, you know, old black ladies in little storefront churches to, you know, white punk, you know, rock type people, you know, like all these different coalitions of people who just like ordinarily would not be together. Like they all came together, you know, for your campaign, which I just thought was uh, truly extraordinary. And one of the most interesting things um, about the book. Um, and so I, I really liked, you know, I, I, as I said, I love the book, but one of the most interesting chapters in the book to me, and I'm surprised that it was when I looked at the title, didn't think it would be, but it was the chapter about victims and survivors. Um, mm -hmm. That chapter I, I found really interesting um, because, you know, as you know, your opponents accuse you of being against victims when you know anybody who reads that chapter will know that nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, it was surprising, extraordinary for me to read that you yourself was a victim of a really violent crime. And, and I don't want you to talk about that now. People can read that uh, in the book. But the thing about this chapter that I like so much is the way you explain what the DA's role is with the victim. I mean, so many traditional prosecutors get that wrong, right? And thinking that they represent the victim, uh, but the relationship between the DA and the victim and who, and who the district attorney actually represents, right? Um, is you get that so right and you explain that so well, and it really is kind of relating to the title of, of the book, right, for the people. So if you can talk about that a little bit, who are the people and talk a bit about victims and, and your relationship to them. Sure, happy to do that. So, uh, you know, the title of the book is For the People. Actually, what you would say in Pennsylvania is for the Commonwealth, but same notion, Virginia too. And that is that it, you know, unlike a defense attorney who stands up and says, I represent Frank Jones, and the defense attorney does represent Frank Jones, the prosecutor does not say the name of the victim because the prosecutor represents all of the people in that jurisdiction. And the sworn oath is to seek justice and uphold the constitution. So that means you are seeking justice, yes, for the victim, but you're seeking justice also for some school kid who will never be in that courtroom, but who needs to have adequate funding for their education or they won't realize their potential. You need to have, you need to make sure that you're also cognizant of the fact that you're representing the defendant 
in the sense that you have to make sure the proceeding is just and it's fair and it upholds the constitution and that the outcome is just. All of that is what the prosecutor does. It's been, it has been sold a long time ago by cynical, ambitious uh, prosecutors who were much more worried about how the press would cover what they did and much more worried about their own personal ambition and running for even higher offices than that springboard that they call the DA's office or, or the chief prosecutor's office. It's a fundamental point, but it's a crucial point. And that's why it is actually the title of the book. Uh, for, way, for way too long, what we have seen is prosecutors who were sold out to police unions. They were sold out to a media that was gonna cover them well if the victims were pleased. Uh, and it, it, was never, it was never really doing the job. It was never taking care to make sure that that little girl who needs money for her school is gonna have it, or that the person you're convicting is actually guilty and has been convicted with proper process. Thank you for that. Um, you know, and I, I think you also talk a lot about victims and trauma and, you know, it's complicated as you point out and not easy, but, you know, oftentimes what, you know, no one really asks what the victims really want. And, you know, far too often, I mean, it's not that they want, they're not saying, you know, necessarily, some do say they want to see the person locked up forever, but a lot of them don't, they really want other things. And so um, thank you for that. Um, so let's get into sort of like what, what you've done in, in your first term. I mean, you've accomplished a lot, you know, reducing the jail and prison population, changing bail practices, getting people out on bail, changing charging policies, holding police officers accountable, a lot of stuff. But as you point out, this is a long game, right? It's gonna take a long time to really achieve what it is that you and so many of us are working for. Um, but what would you, as looking back over your first term, if you had to identify your, your greatest accomplishment, what, what would that be? Well, my greatest accomplishment, because it is long-term, is recruiting. And thank you for your help in that, Angela. I truly appreciate it. We've hired a couple of absolutely fabulous, fabulous, young uh, lawyers out of American, often on the recommendation of one Angela J. Davis. Um, so that really is important because we're not talking about what's going to get done in two years. We're talking about what's going to get done in another 20 years. And therefore, we have to bring the right people into these offices to change that culture. But if I were to tick off a couple of things in addition to that, you know, we reduced the future years of incarceration by cutting it in half before the pandemic shut everything down. So don't listen to post-pandemic data right now because courts are closed, but cut that in half. We reduced the level of mass supervision by two thirds. Uh, you know, we have exonerated 20 people at this point. And in almost every case, I can tell you with certainty that they did not do the crime and the person who did it got away, largely as a result of the system getting fixed on an innocent person and locking them up for a long time. You know, we started a unit to protect immigrants in ways that are important. And this again speaks to the chapter about victims. Because uh, and anyone who has a marginalized status, especially if that status is somewhat criminalized, is less likely to reach out to police and engage the justice system to protect them. And this is the terrible consequence of the kind of prosecution we've had in the past. You know, you, you are going to have serial killers prey on sex workers until you protect sex, work, sex workers. You are going to have American criminals rob uh, undocumented immigrants who are working hard and steal all their tools as long as we have a system that will not protect undocumented immigrants when they are the victims of crime. So that, that's another thing we did. We also opened a first ever unit uh, for the purpose of protecting workers who have crimes committed against them by their employers. And finally, we've been pretty serious about police accountability in ways that, I mean, anybody should be serious, but certainly in Philly, they have not in the past. Great, and so gotta ask the flip side. Um, what, what lessons did you learn? I mean, is there something you would do differently or that you will do differently in your next term as a result of something you've learned um, during your first term? I think there are a lot of things that I would do differently. Um, the skill set of a trial lawyer is not necessarily exactly the same skill set as is required for the new job, but even that's complicated because some of the traditional ways of politicking turn out to be wrong. Uh, and when you're getting literally two out of every three voters to say, yep, we'll take that again, you're doing something right. So I think the biggest thing we did not do right initially was we didn't talk enough 
about reinvesting all the savings that we are generating, the economic savings we are generating into prevention. This is becoming, there is much more of a consensus now in Philadelphia around this. There's more talk nationally, especially in terms of gun violence about the importance and the necessity of investment in prevention. But the truth is that if we do not recognize what it means to reduce future years of, con of, of incarceration by 18,000, which is what we've done so far, do a little math on that, you're at about $900 million, close to a billion dollars saved by an entity, the DA's office that's only funded at 50 million bucks, right? We've generated unbelievable savings for the state and for the county. There's no showing that it's made us less safe in any way. We would like that money to go into prevention. Thank you very much. That's where it should be. That's where it always should have been. You will have a safer and uh, society. You will heal all kinds of terrible problems that we have if you do that. But if we don't do it, we all know where that money is going to go. That money is going to go, uh, you know, for new homeowners who are uh, who have nice incomes to have a tax break, even though the house is 400 grand. And that's not where it should go. It should go into these things that heal society. So that, that I think is something we should have talked about from the very beginning. Um, but maybe the moment has come now that we have some data to show how much we are actually saving, at least in future dollars uh, and at least uh, in theory. Great, thanks. Thanks so much for that. Um, so I wanna talk a bit about uh, a phenomenon that's going on that you know those of us who work in the progressive prosecutor space anticipated, but did not anticipate it was going to be quite this bad. And that is the extraordinary attacks on newly elected progressive prosecutors. Well, not even newly elected, like throughout their terms, right? So you and so many progressive prosecutors have been attacked by those who are intent on maintaining the status quo, police unions, some judges, attorneys general, other, other groups. And, and also being attacked from within your office as other progressive prosecutors have experienced coming into an office with people from the prior administration who aren't with the program. Um, and you know, as you know, this has happened to other uh, progressive prosecutors and I wanna just sort of call out the names of Kim Gardner and Kim Fox because they have endured those attacks but on top of those attacks, they have endured racist and sexist attacks like we never ever imagined. Um, so I guess what my question is, what would you say to someone who's thinking about running on a progressive platform for district attorney, but they're saying, well, I was thinking about doing this, but now that I see what's happening to you, Mr. Krasner and to Ms. Fox and Ms. Gardner, I mean, I don't, I don't think I want to do this. I'm, I, you know, I don't want to endure this. What, what would you say to a person who's, who's thinking that way? I, I would say the criticism is the greatest proof that we're winning. The, there is no need for them to attack Rachel Rollins and Kim Gardner, Aramis Ayala, everyone else we just talked about. There's no need for them to do that unless and until we get to the point where they are truly cornered and they are truly threatened. They are cornered. They are threatened. Their approach to the world, which is fundamentally racist and brutal, their approach to the world, which has devastated this country, is under attack. And so for mostly economic reasons in reality, but also you know, profound reasons of um, white supremacist thought, for, for all those reasons, they don't want to give it up. And when they don't want to get it, give it up, you're going to get a very, very strong reaction. You know, this is, this is why I think it's so important to view this as a social justice movement and to think of it in those terms, if you think of it as a 30 year arc towards justice, at least towards winning a major battle before, you know, as with all movements, we zigzag off to another major battle. If we think of it that way, then this all makes sense. This is the kind of uh, vast, powerful, moneyed resistance that you see when there is tremendous progress being made. If we had all gone in and not gotten much done, it'd be quiet. So um, embrace the hate, get, get in the pit and fight with us. I mean, that's what we need. And I'll tell you something, for anyone listening, we need more people to run. We need people who don't think and didn't think they would ever be in politics like me to say, eh, maybe I should be in politics. And more to the point, we need those of you who, who know the person who should run. And know that that person has never been egocentric enough to think about it, 
we need you to go to them and say, have you ever thought about, did you ever think about, do you think, what, what do you think would happen if, and if we start to see that, then we're not just going to be dealing with uh, 10% of the United States having elected and reelected progressive prosecutors, such as Mosby and everybody else we've been talking about. We're going to be looking in the next several years at winning a hell of a lot of races in a hell of a lot of places. Uh, but we need the candidates. We need the candidates to come forward. We need them to step up and we need them to be real and have a life story, especially a life's work that is legit and that will make voters say, yeah, I'll try that. I'll do that. Yeah, thank you for that. Now, but I want to push a little more on that. Like, I agree with everything that you said. Um, but what do you say? I mean, you know, sure, the, it's absolutely true that if you're doing the right thing, they're going to push back. And I think the biggest testament to all of this is that every reform minded or progressive prosecutor I know of who has run for reelection has been reelected. And, you know, I, I'm thinking of you, of course, of Kim Gardner and of Kim Fox, three of the most attacked, uh, you know, uh, progressive prosecutors. And yet the people said, you know, despite all the attacks and despite all, despite all the accusations and false accusations, uh, blaming you for all kinds of things that you're not responsible for, the people spoke again and said, you know what? No, we like these last four years and we want more. And so I think that's a testament to that. But how do you deal with the attacks? Like for someone who's like, I don't want to live my life constantly dealing with it those kinds of attacks, even though I'm interested in doing the right thing and pushing forward this agenda. How did you deal with it? Like, did you have a support system? I mean, what were the things that you did to kind of push through when all these people were throwing all this hate at you and you know, threatening you and doing all kinds of things? What were the things that you did that kept you going day to day? Hmm, boy, now you're asking me to explain how how um, I am slightly abnormal. Is that what we're getting at here? <laughs> no, you listen. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, to read you your Miranda rights. You know those already, Larry. So I mean, yeah. you have people around you, either in the prosecutor space or wherever that you kind of, I'm thinking of trying to give me that. Want me to give no, you? I'll, I'll give you the full answer. You know, the answer is that if you are if you were a public defender in the city of Philadelphia from 1987 to 1992, when uh, this country was thinking a certain kind of way, then you went into a courtroom and you were the second most hated person in that courtroom every single time you went into that courtroom and you got your brains bashed in and you had to develop a capacity to take some kind of an unfair beat down because that's just how it is. You know, if you have been someone who was suing Philadelphia police during decades when everybody was worshiping police and saw no problem with their gunning down unarmed black men by shooting them in the back over and over and over and over, then you have had your beat downs in a federal courtroom too. You know, there are other people, if you look at Kim Fox's history, who've had some real adversity that they had to overcome early in their lives. I had a little bit of that, but, but not nearly like Kim Fox had to endure or so many of my other colleagues have had to endure in their lives and in their families. I, there, I think there, it is not for everyone. But I do think that a lot of people are able to go back to some sort of life experience that they've had that has enabled them to take punches and to and to keep getting back up for something that, you know, that's just more important, that's bigger than them. Now, does it also help that my wife is a loving person who keeps me on the right track? Yes, it does. Does it also help that, you know, there was this, this level of support that I got every day when I walked down the street from people who don't write for newspapers? You know, the little old lady at the bus stop who takes her walker and comes shuffling over to me to tell me I'm doing a good job? Yeah. You know, that's very gratifying when, when they just beat your brains in with the morning paper and four people come up on the sidewalk and tell you you're doing a good job and then wag a finger and say, don't you worry about that paper. That tells you something about what's going on. So I do think connectedness to the people because the people want what we're doing. And then also having had, uh, you know, having had the opportunity to thicken your skin over time for whatever reasons there may have been. Yeah, thanks for that. And I know that there you there's a group of you progressive prosecutors who know each other and also sort of provide support for each other as well. And I was one of those public defenders that got beat up every day. 
with pride for 12 years. So I hear where you're coming from. So we have a bunch of questions um, that, are, that are coming in. So I think I should turn to the audience now, um, the audience questions. Uh, the first question I have here is, um, given that for many prosecutors, their career mobility is incentivized or even dictated by their conviction rate, how do you change on a systemic scale the goals of a prosecutor to align more with restorative and progressive justice practices? What do you envision the new parameters to be? So that's a great question. I would start with the most basic point, which is we have conviction rates. We don't have accurate conviction rates. I mean, my office does, but even our metrics for how we, we assess these things are crazy. I sometimes get asked about our conviction rate compared to a prior administration where, or one of the administrations responsible for 20 exonerations. They're still taking credit for that. They put an innocent person in jail forever and let a guilty one go potentially to commit more crimes. They're still taking credit for that. So we have to correct the metrics that we're dealing with if we're going to look at that at all. Second, you have to change the report card for the prosecutors in the office. We have done that. You know, one of the one of the items that we have on the report card for a supervisor is has this person ever come to you and said, I got a problem with this case. I see a flaw in this case. I'm not so sure this person is guilty. I'm not so sure this officer is telling the truth. You know, that in our world shows balance. It's, just, it's a positive. It's something that, that we should consider when we are giving raises and when we are moving people from unit to unit. Um, you know, that's part of it. Obviously, there's all kinds of layers and levels of training that should be happening. And we do a lot of that as well. We usually have weekly trainings that are in good times, weekly that are mandatory for the attorneys, where we look at things like the anatomy of an exoneration, how mistakes got made things of that sort. Uh, but it's, I mean, it all comes back to the same fundamental thing, which is you're trying to be fair. And if you are trying to be fair, then your report card should be for people to be judged on whether or not they're trying to be fair. That's not what it was before. You're absolutely right. Before it was viewed as a sport. And the only thing that mattered was your batting average. And, uh, you know, if you were using an illegal bat and doing 14 other things you're not allowed to do, everybody was winking because you hit the ball. Just it's a fundamentally, you know, we have to take a moral position on this, an ethical position on this. And we also have to just be cognizant of how bad it's been in the past. Great. OK, the next question is, what is the DA's role in subduing the spike in violent crimes in our big cities? Well, the, you know, the DA has a role, along with every other uh, criminal justice player and pr probably even more importantly, along with local government, which determines budget and therefore determines investment in things like prevention, and with all the community-based resources that can either be held back or they can be encouraged and funded. Um, we are gatekeepers for a hell of a lot of resources. And if we burn up all those resources, then there is no money for prevention. And we also have to use our bully pulpit because, you know, in Philly, you're dealing with eight a budget in the billions, but the DA's office only has about 30 detectives as, composed to, as compared to 6,500 active officers. And the DA's office only has a $50 million budget. So you have to realize that to a large extent, what you're doing is you're gatekeeping for society's resources. To me, that means you're gonna focus on the most serious crime, but you are also uh, very careful not to over incarcerate for stuff that is not crime that tears apart society. And you are, and we are going to have to be loud and proud, and work with other criminal justice partners to push money towards prevention, because that, in my opinion, is where we will have the permanent, long-lasting uh, improvements. I could go on and on about LA and Chicago. There are models out there. There are other models like Cure Violence, which, when it's disconnected from law enforcement, is very, very effective. But then again, we'd be here all day. So I'll just stop. No, that's very helpful. Um, prevention, definitely the key. And you know, before moving to the next question, I've got to just throw in a, a thought here. Um, this question about the spike in violent crimes. You know, there, there's, there's been this false narrative that's been put out there by certain entities that progressive prosecutors are somehow causing violent, the spike in violent crime. And I just want to direct people to. There's a lot of uh, research has been done on this to show that that is an absolute falsehood. In fact, if you look at the spike in violence, there's just the same spikes in violent crimes are going on in cities 
with traditional law and order lock them up prosecutors. It's the same spikes. And look to the work of John Pfaff. If, if, if you don't follow him on Twitter, Pfaff, T-F-A-F-F, -F, please do. For those of you who are interested in this issue, he's done a lot of research to debunk that myth and he puts it out on Twitter in a nice digestible way. So um, I just wanted to add that. Before going to our next question, which is, uh, just as recruiting the right lawyers affects the quality of prosecution within a DA's office, it's also true that recruiting for police departments have favored combat veterans and those with insurgent war experiences. Giving them surplus combat equipment does not make for community policing. What impact have you had on your what, what impact have you had on hiring practices for the Philadelphia Police Department? Mm, great question. Not as much as I'd like, I can tell you that. Although, uh, I mean, the truth is that this election is being seen in Philadelphia uh, as a real Waterloo for the police union. One of the headlines that was put out there by a major paper right after the election, because the, the defeat of the FOP's candidate was so big, FOP standing for Fraternal Order of Police. The headline was, and I quote, F period, L, period, O, period, P, period. Now that has impact because to the extent it becomes really clear that Philadelphians are disgusted with what the extremely conservative leadership of that police union has done, their position is somewhat undermined in negotiations. That is one thing that we have done. We've also been a bully pulpit for things like uh, you should stop lessening the punishments for everything. And by everything, I mean stuff like driving your police car drunk. Yep, they really do stuff like that. Uh, and, and we have a police misconduct database, which is having its impact for people who are already hired, meaning you don't get paid nearly as much when nobody wants to call you as a witness because you're a liar. We have been punching certain police officers very hard in the wallet, and they don't like it. And it affects a lot of things, including their assignments, which then, of course, affects their pot potential to be promoted. So we're able to do a lot in that regard. But, you know, the battle with the conservative leadership of these police unions uh, is going to take a long time. And it, we are going to have to get to the point where voters are not just enthusiastic and participating because of progressive prosecution. They are now looking for progressive mayors who will appoint progressive police commissioners and police chiefs. They are now saying, I want a police chief, I want a police commissioner who, if it's necessary, is going to sit on a stand and testify against their own in a case like George Floyd's. That's what I want. And I want recruitment. I mean, you want to know how bad recruitment is in Philly? One of the detectives who recruits in Philly got caught at the insurrection. And um, yeah, I mean, that's not a good thing. So it just tells you a little bit about who they're recruiting, doesn't it? Uh, and by the way, the head of our local Proud Boys, it turns out, an ex-combat veteran is the son of two Philadelphia police officers. This is a bad thing. This is a bad thing. We got some, some deep-rooted culture that needs to be, uh, how shall I put it, pulled up and eliminated. So it, I don't have any answers for you about having been able to achieve a whole lot yet. Uh, but I do think that we have the opportunity as voters become excited about their achievements with prosecution to move it and to have a 2.0 progressive prosecution to other aspects of criminal justice that are electable. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, you know, that it's about democracy again. And I'm so glad you pointed that out, that in most cities, it's the mayor who point, appoints the police chief. And although you don't vote for the police chief, you vote for the mayor. And so you'd have to tell your mayor what kind of police chief you want. You know, that's how you impact this. So thanks for pointing that out. So the next question, um, you were one of the first DAs in the nation to require prosecutors to tell a judge at sentencing how much it will cost taxpayers to send someone to prison. Can you shed some light on why your office rolled out that policy and whether you think it's had any impact? Additionally, have any prosecutors in your office or any judges criticized the policy? Great question. So I rolled it out because um, there was a complete disconnection in the system between years of incarceration, what they cost, and what was being sacrificed. There is an opportunity cost, as the economists love to say, when you decide a homeless person should be in jail for a year for stealing food for the fifth time, and it's going to cost 50 grand. There is an opportunity cost in terms of that little girl I keep talking about in that public school who's underfunded. So I, I wanted to reestablish that connection. 
between uh, years in custody or months in custody and the price of all of that. And I wanted our attorneys more than anything to think carefully about it before they stood up to ask for a period of, of years. You know, I have a first assistant who was a judge for many years and, and a public defender and a prosecutor very early in her career. She's in her mid eighties now, who says there came a moment when, when uh, one was the new five. And what she means by that is there came a moment during her career in criminal justice, which is 60 years, when what used to be a year in jail all of a sudden became five years in jail and people didn't even notice. It didn't even occur to them. Uh, we, can't, we can't divorce cost from what we're doing because it is at the cost of prevention. Yeah. So the next question I've sort of uh, answered a bit, but I want to see if you uh, want to also answer it. Um, it says, it sounds like the recent increases in crime that are being reported will be used by conservative forces and police systems to block justice reforms. How do you argue against them? So wonderful question. I mean, here's the truth. We don't have recent increases in crime. We have decreases in crime uh, during the pandemic period. We also have decreases in violent crime. We have a sharp spike in violent crime with guns, uh, especially shootings, fatal and non-fatal shootings. So um, people tend to generalize this, but no, in fact, one of the truly anomalous things about the pandemic is that both crime and violent crime are going down at the same time that the shooting spike is so severe and so high. Uh, how do we argue against it? I mean, here's the truth. 50, uh, the 50 major cities last year had an average 42% increase in shootings, fatal and non-fatal. And this country last year had an 18% increase. That means they got an increase in shootings in cornfields. We actually saw a terrible spike in mass shootings. Uh, many of them occurring outside of urban areas. We don't exactly know why, but we know this is all happening during a pandemic. And I think the, the clearest and most coherent argument is that the lesson that comes out of this pandemic and the period of this massive spike is a lesson that points very much in prevention. I say it for this reason. If you just use your common sense, you look around, we have now gone through over a year when you had, at least in, in my city, you had high school classrooms closed, you have had rec centers closed, swimming pools closed. You've had summer job programs closed, summer camps closed. Normal employment for teenagers and young adults, because this is teenagers and young adults, killing teenagers and young adults. Normal employment in low dollar economy obliterated because everybody making less than 40 grand got stomped. Um, you know, I can go on with the list, but organized sports disappeared from our lives for a year. That has never happened in my 60 years, both in and out of school, organized sports. Think of how fundamental that is to our society. And I could go on, but when you see all of these things disappear everywhere, in the cornfields, in the big cities, all at the same time, and you see the simultaneous spike that has nothing to do whether, with whether Republicans or Democrats or, or progressive DAs or traditional ones are running the show, what you're seeing is how terrible it is when we strip away prevention and how much we have underestimated its importance, how we need to not only invest in it, but double down on our investment in prevention. Great. Well, we have one last question before we close, um, and that is this. There have been numerous articles written since your re-election last week about the significance of your re-election for the progressive prosecutor movement. NBC News wrote that your primary quote was seen as a referendum on whether the current wave of reform-minded prosecutors would be blamed for increasing gun violence and whether the progressive movement could survive an uptick in homicides across the country. Do you think your reelection is a harbinger for reelections of your peers nationwide? Yes, but I say that uh, that is just one more point in the line. Let's look back a couple of years to Kim Fox's election. They went at they went at Kim Fox about and Kim Gardner too. Kim Gardner yeah. and Kim Fox they went at him about as hard as you could with all kinds of money and all kinds of craziness. Didn't work. Didn't work. And then Gascon gets elected in L.A. Holy cow. You know, they went after him. They're still going after him. Now they're going to recall him in a city that likes him and doesn't want to recall. Right. And then they did it here. And, you know, this was this year's showdown. They are losing and they are losing bigger. I mean, you know, I keep coming back to it, but to have more than two out of every three people say, yeah, we've heard all your arguments about terrible violence, crash causes, gives away guns and all this nonsense. We've heard all that. We're not buying it. 
We're not buying it. We are down for reform. We understand prevention's got to happen. When you see that, and you also see the, the broad range of people who are supporting it, we are looking at the future and the signs are very positive. Uh, you know, for my progressive colleagues, you know, Mosby got reelected. I don't think if, if Rachel wanted to run again, I don't think she'd have any problem being reelected. We are in a period of time when the winningest political party in the United States is the unnamed progressive prosecutors party. We do better than the Democrats. We do better than the Republicans. Uh, and so long as the people getting into the club are real and the real progressives, we're just going to keep doing that. Yeah, I mean, you know, gives us hope that democracy truly is still alive, right? Um, well, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation, Larry. And I also just wanted to say something to the audience. There's a terrific PBS docuseries going on now called For the People about Larry and much more about Larry. It's also about a lot more about this whole movement that's terrific. So I, I uh, recommend that as well. So Larry, we wish you the best of luck with your book, For the People, A Story of Justice and Power. And our thanks to the audience for all of your questions. I wish we had time to answer them all. And thank you very much to today's production partner, the NYU Bradamus Center. And a quick note from the Brennan Center before we leave you, stay up to date on key issues impacting our democracy with weekly analysis and insight from Brennan Center experts. Sign up for the briefing newsletter at brennancenter.org slash briefing. Be sure to register at brennancenter.org slash events. Thank you all for coming and supporting the work of the Brennan Center for Justice.